Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to this Middleton Center event, The Racialization of Religion. Uh, it is my honor to welcome you uh, to this event. Um, Middleton Center, um, for those who may be tuning in for the first time, here for the first time, uh, is a cross-disciplinary research institute that is designed to focus on the issues of race, citizenship, and justice, and to be able to bring academic and scholarly discussions to these very important conversations both on our campus, in our city, and around the state. Um, it was sort of forged in the flames and the fires of 2015 and has grown. Um, and now we're in our second year uh, following this institution. So we are very excited about this. I am incredibly excited about today's presentation uh, because Professor Aziz and I, we, co we clerked for the same judge, known each other, and I look back 18 years. Uh, it's really a long time. <laughs> You're really old. Hey, that's all right. So. I'm going to introduce them because you really don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from these panelists uh, today. So let me introduce the panelists, uh, our moderator, and I'll tell you sort of how the, the, the run of the show will be and our conversation. So Professor Sahar Aziz is professor of law, the Chancellor Social Justice Scholar and Middle East and Legal Studies Scholar at Rutgers University uh, Law School. She earned a JD and an MA in Middle East Studies from the University of Texas, and her scholarship adopts an interdisciplinary approach to examine intersections of national security, race, and civil rights, with a focus on the adverse impact of national security laws um, and policies on racial, ethnic, and religious minorities in the United States. Her research also investigates the relationship between authoritarianism, terrorism, and rule of law in the Middle East. And she is the founding director of the Interdisciplinary Rutgers Center for Security, Race, and Rights and a faculty affiliate of the African American Studies Department at Rutgers University of Newark. She also serves on the Rutgers Newark Chancellor's Commission on Diversity and Transformation, as well as on the editorial board of the Arab Law Quarterly and the International Journal of Middle East Studies. She is the recipient of numerous awards, uh, such as the Soros Equality Fellowship, the Research Making Impact Award by the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, an Emerging Scholar by Diverse Issues in Higher Education, uh, and Democracy in the Arab World. Um, she has published over 30 articles and the book that she has most recently publishing, and I'm so glad that we, we fit into her book tour, <laughs> is The Racial Muslim, When Racism Quashes Religious Freedom, which examines how religious bigotry racializes immigrant Muslims through a historical and comparative approach. You may have seen her on CNN, on BBC, uh, BBC World, PBS, C-SPAN. Uh, prior to joining the academy, she served as a senior policy advisor for the Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, where she worked on law and policy at the intersection of national security and civil liberties. Not only did she also serve as a law clerk, the Honorable Andre M. Davis, the District Court of Maryland, she's also the vice president of the Westfield, New Jersey uh, School Board. Finding the time to do all these things, I have no idea, but clearly an accomplished and overachiever, right? <laughs> Uh, that is our invited guest from out of town, Mr. Aziz. Um, now, our own campus, Dr. Dave Duncan, is an associate professor uh, here at the MU Department of Black Studies and the Director of Peace Studies. He is also an affiliate faculty member at the Kinder Institute on Constitutional Democracy and in the Departments of History and Religious Studies. He holds a PhD in history from the University of Warwick, Great Britain, and was also educated at the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. He has published several books and articles on slavery and freedom in the Americas, focusing on the Caribbean and has published widely on the history of the Rastafari movement. And his research focuses on the history and culture of the Caribbean and the wider Black Atlantic. And he's authored publications exploring slave resistance, British colonialism, decolonization, and the politics of the Rastafari. And his most recent book is Women and Resistance in the Early Rastafari Movement. Professor Dunkley, thank you. Uh, Professor Rabia Gregory, an associate professor and director of the undergraduate studies at the University of Missouri, earning an AB in religion and medieval studies from Duke University and her MA and PhD in religious studies from the University of North Carolina at Capitol Hill. Our condolences for March Madness. <laughs> her primary research interest is the history of Christianity in medieval and early modern Europe. She approached the study of religion through book history, material culture, and theories of gender. Her research involves situating the literary culture of late medieval and early modern women's religious communities within their social and cultural networks. And she has published on the relationship between religion, new media, and medieval culture in contemporary video games. 
She's also co-edited the interdisciplinary book series, Christianities Before Modernity. And her most recent book, I believe it's Marrying Jesus in Medieval and Early Modern Northern Europe, Popular Culture and Religious Reform. And lastly, thank you, Professor Berry. And lastly, our moderator, Kate Kelly. Uh, she is a visiting assistant professor and has been since 2019 uh, and a visiting instructor since 2009. So she has been here quite some time as well, like all the rest of us, as it hasn't left yet, thank you. Thankfully, <laughs> we're actually very appreciative of that. I'll tell you why in a moment. In the Department of Religious Studies here at the University of Missouri. Uh, she earned her PhD in English with a concentration in folklore and culture studies and graduate minor in women's and gender studies. An MA in English with a concentration in critical theory, both from the University of Missouri, Columbia. She has a master's of philosophy, religion, culture, and critical theory from the University of Stirling in Scotland. Uh, and a BA in religious studies with concentration in Western religions uh, from the University of California in Santa Barbara. Her research interests are critical race theory, decoloniality, I'm not pronouncing correctly. Decoloniality. Thank you, decoloniality, whiteness, social justice, intersections of American Christianities with race, gender, and sexuality. And she has joined the two intrepid co directors of the center as our third wheel in our sort of immediate office space of being our support and quite frankly, doing an excellent job along with so many of our other support folks who are also in the room. You will have an opportunity to meet my co-director later on. Thank you for moderating, Kate. Uh, Dr. Shonikin at the end of the evening, but I wanna have our panelists get, get to it. Each will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and then Kate will moderate a discussion, a Q and A from both from folks who are present as well as from folks who are uh, seeing us by Zoom. And then we will have a close with my co-director and friend indeed, Dr. Stephanie Shankar. And so, Professor Aziz, I turn it over to you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, well, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. This is my first time at the zoo, is the zoo. zoo. And it's exactly what I had heard. It's a beautiful campus and it feels like a lively environment for any student. So bravo to, to all of you. And I'm very grateful to Professor Mitchell for inviting me. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to be among family. As, as those of us who have clerked for judges know that the clerkship family, the, clerk, the clerkship um, cohorts are, are like a family. And it's really an honor to be on this esteemed panel with everyone. So I wanted to just take the 10 minutes I had to give a very brief synopsis of, of this book um, that took me five years to write. <laughs> uh, because as I dug deeper and deeper into uh, various disciplinary literatures, I was learning, but also connecting a lot of dots that admittedly before I started the research, I didn't expect to find. Uh, I wrote this book anticipating I would write a little bit about pre 9-11 discrimination against Muslims and a lot about post 9-11 discrimination against Muslims, and it would be primarily a legal book. But what it has really turned into is an interdisciplinary American studies book um, that leans heavy on legal history. So the, the, what brought me to this research, to this project was this nagging question and frustration and sense of powerlessness to some extent, especially as a lawyer. Because on the one hand, you know, <laughs> you're taught as a lawyer to fetishize the law. You are taught that law is the solution to many problems. And you know, whether or not that's accurate is a, is a different question we have in, in legal education, but I am certainly a product of this formalist school of thought, which I think is the dominant um, school of thought in American law schools. And therefore, when I learned about constitutional law and when I learned about uh, statutes that implemented or supplemented constitutional rights, I took them seriously. And that the one that was most important to Muslims, especially after 9-11, was the First Amendment, the Free Exercise Clause, and to some extent, the anti, you know, the Establishment Clause. And with that, and you have statutes like the Religious Land Use and Inmate Protection Act, and you have the Religious uh, Freedom and Restoration Act, and you have state models of it. So religion is privileged, religious freedom is privileged in the United States. It's, it's something that really isn't that much up for debate. The culture wars are about whether or not it's being uh, preserved, whether in fact 
the particularly those that identify as Christian evangelicals, they have bemoaned that their religious freedom rights are being violated um, in various ways, usually surrounding issues around reproductive health, um, sexual orientation, um, schools and, and funding of parochial schools, et cetera. But you know, however you come out on these cultural issues, everyone tends to agree religious freedom is important. And that's important to know because in places like France, where Muslims are also dealing with a lot of discrimination, the, the dominant narrative is laicite, which is staunch secularism and keeping religion out of any public eye or public behavior. Uh, and they have their own history with that. Part of it is the colonization of Algeria, which is certainly rooted in anti-Arab racism and Islamophobia, but also their own uh, French Revolution and, and relationship with the Catholic Church, right? So you have to you have to really look at the context of the particular country. And this book is about the United States. Okay, so when Muslims were being discriminated against so aggressively, 2001, 2002, 2003, and it just kept going. And I speak from a position of uh, a former law student, ACLU intern, community organizer, um, public policy advocates, pro bono counsel, civil rights litigator, and then government uh, senior advisor. So I have gone through all of the different roles of trying to stop this discrimination, trying to understand why it's happening and how to use the law to stop it. Um, and each time it was clear that the law was not being uh, enforced or it wasn't being taken seriously when it came to Muslims. And so, and then perhaps more, more troublingly, it wasn't being taken seriously by the public, many of whom, subparts of the public who themselves prioritize religious freedom, particularly the Christian evangelicals and those that are on the right. And to some extent, some of the, what I will call the liberals, you know, as a general term. So the, I, I kept saying, I don't understand. Why can you on one side of your mouth say, religious freedom is a fundamental right. It's a fundamental American principle. And so it's both normatively and legally something we privilege. And yet, when you looked at the polls, it was somewhere between 40% to 60%, depending on the year that you're looking at over the last 20 years, that kept reporting unfavorable views of Muslims and support for national security policies and practices that directly um, targeted them and profiled them and threatened their liberty and certainly threatened their dignity or you know, eroded their dignity. And I couldn't, that, that paradox over the years, once I realized the law wasn't working and what I was seeing on paper, it was almost as if there was a parentheses that was in, in invisible visible ink that said, except for Muslims. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I, this is a really interesting, and then at this point I'm an academic, and I thought, this is a really fascinating research question. And that's <clears throat> essentially the path that, that got me started. And as those who have the chance to read the book will find, it's a long protracted checkered path that Muslims are just the latest way station on. Um, and that was an epiphany for me. Now I understand historians, especially in religious studies experts, uh, for them, this is probably something that they learned in their, in their um, research, but this is not something we're taught in American schools. Uh, and we're certainly not taught it in law school because of this fetishization of, of law and the constitution. So the, the book goes on a path where the first half of the book uh, explores, well, let me restate the research question, or, or let me tell you the answer to the research question, which is why is a religious minority, Muslims in this case, being so overtly discriminated against by the state and by members of the public in a country that privileges religious freedom legally and normatively? And the answer, I think, lies in understanding how racialization works, and more specifically, how religious identity works to racialize, the work that it does to racialize. And what has become evident to me, and I'm, I'm interested to hear what my colleagues have to say on the panel is, the literature on religious studies and race studies, and especially critical race theory is so siloed. 
And when you do the research, you only find it's almost as if there's blinders or there's a wall and they're not talking to each other, right? These disciplines are not talking to each other. So I'm a critical race theorist since my research was very much in the race space as it intersected with law and civil rights and then within the national security context. And what I was saying was, oh, religious identity for Muslims is similar to skin color, right? It's similar to hair texture, it's same, similar to phenotypical characteristics that racialize various minorities, particularly Blacks, Latinos, Asians. And there, there just wasn't enough attention being paid to that in the critical race theory space. But as I endeavored and started reading the religious studies, I, it was clear that Jews, Mormons, and Catholics had absolutely experienced religious bigotry. But I didn't find, and again, I'm very interested in, this is wonderful about being in, religious, uh, in an interdisciplinary panel, because what I couldn't find was the use of the language racialization. It was we, the way that the phenomenon was being described was religious bigotry and religious discrimination and maybe based on theological differences, but there wasn't this, the nomenclature wasn't that they were being raced. Now there was some literature about the in between races. So the ethnic whites, the not quite white. Uh, and, but I don't think that, I think we still need to do more work about this racialization of religion and the role that re re religious identity does. And so what I think Muslim, the experiences of Muslims has done, uh, I mean, unfortunately for them, has made it starkly clear that religious identity racializes. That, and I use examples of the example of post 9-11, you can be a white presenting Muslim who name is Muhammad, and people then know you are a Muslim, but you will not be able to pass as white. Whereas pre 9-11, Mo could pass as white, right? And even if it's Muhammad, most people, there were polls that showed 64% of Americans didn't even know what Islam was. They didn't have a positive or negative view. Uh, and so even if you go by Muhammad rather than Mo, they'll say, okay, that's interesting. And then it's very context specific. Whereas after 9-11 with the media and with the government and with political officials or elected officials speaking so overtly in anti-Muslim um, ways, then everybody, there, there was no secret, right? So essentially one could say that Muslims entered collective blackness, right? If you think of the concept of collective blackness and if you, you and ex discuss it in the context of Derek Bell's black white paradigm where black is permanently at the bottom and white is permanently at the top, but all of which, both of which are socially constructed Right. And, and then collective blackness takes it to, and Edward Bonilla Silva and other uh, sociologists of race have talked about this, is where, especially when you're looking at Latin America and the Caribbean, you see it, it doesn't, it's not just like a descendants of slaves, but it becomes a broader group. So ultimately that, so that's essentially the way that I have analyzed it. And then throughout the book, I just look at how the Jew, the experience of Jews, Catholics and Mormons is similar to Muslims, how it's different. I look at the ways in which pre 9-11 versus a racialization of Muslims or what I call the social construction of the racial Muslim. So the racial Muslim is not intended to argue, or I use that term, not to say Muslims are in fact a race. I'm arguing Muslims are being treated like a race specifically a suspect race. And as a result, when people who are committed to religious freedom for others and themselves support anti-Muslim government practices, anti-Muslim rhetoric, anti-Muslim public private actors uh, actions, they don't feel like hypocrites. They see it in the same, because racism is an American tradition. <laughs> Right, it is, and and only. I mean, we can't. Those of us who are of a certain age, which I think all of us are, we remember not too long ago 
where if you didn't subscribe to colorblindness, something you, know, you were accused of being all sorts of awful things, and that the, the war on terror and the war on drugs was clearly an anti-Black systemic racist project, a racial project, but this language of systemic racism is very new. And the fact that it has gone mainstream for now, because we know there'll be retrenchment, is, is not always been the case. Whereas religious freedom, I guess what, you know, this is what I'm off arguing and I, I'm, people may not agree with me, but I do think that in contrast to racism, I think religious freedom is still held up on a pedestal in people's minds. And that, oh no, we don't, this is where we bring in refugees. We have an international commission the Commission on International Religious Freedom, we have a First Amendment. So there, there is still this, you can even call, you may think it's an illusion or a delusion, but it's still something that is um, held as sanctimonious. Whereas racism is, is kind of like, yeah, we're working on it, right? It's, we've accepted that, yeah, we're, we're, we're just gonna pretend it doesn't exist anymore, but we know that it does and, and we, we accept that that's just part of our society. Um, okay, so I, my 10 minutes up and I'm looking forward to, um, to engaging with, with everyone and, and thank you again for inviting me. Thank you. Yes, it's my time now. All right, so um, thank you for your, for your comments. And um, as you were, as you were um, talking, I was thinking about the um, Nation of Islam and the presence of black Muslims in this country um, since slavery and um, most, much more visibly since the, the, the start of the 20th century. And I'm wondering with them being um, black and Muslim, how did the um, racism um, affect them in, um, when, with, in terms of those two identities? And I, I, I think about that because the, 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 the black Muslim movement in this country began largely in response to racism. So uh, immediately they recognized that the um, racism was a, a serious problem and that religion could, um, particularly Islam, could be sort of a, a unifying um, um, process for the black community in trying to combat um, America's racial dynamic. So, uh, I, I, and, and this kind of brings me to the book that I wrote on uh, Rastafari women. So my, what really, what I was really trying to find out through the story uh, of women in this, in this movement, at uh, the beginning period of the movement was how they made use of religion to challenge um, um, issues such as racism. Um, and in the context of the Caribbean, uh, colonialism. And what I discovered was really that women, looking more closely at women, actually changes a lot of what we know or thought we knew about the um, Rastafari movement. Um, one of the, the, the things that I discovered was that for women, relig the religious elements of the movement was a, a they joined in response to being disappointed by what the, the traditional churches had, had been offering. Uh, many of them had come out of the Anglican church, which is in this country would be the Episcopal church, um, which was the church of state. The others um, came out of the Baptist church and which was very surprising to me because the Baptist church in the context of the Caribbean and, of, and also in the context of, um, of, of Britain was the more progressive church, the church that advocated the abolition of, uh, of slavery, for example. The church was, that was always defi defending black protests against um, um, post-slavery systems of oppression like land dispossession and disenfranchisement. So I was very surprised that in the early 20th century, um, 1932 to be precise, when the Rastafari movement started, women were complaining that they were disappointed by these traditional churches, that they had not gone far enough in, in helping the black population to uplift itself. So that, 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 that became a very important um, part of, 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 of what I tried to explore. And as I explored that 
that departure of women from the traditional churches into this movement, I realized that a lot of what they were concerned about was how race connected or to use the popular term intersected with, with issues of class, with issues of, of, of gender, and very surprising to me, sexuality as well. There was a big conversation within the within within the circles of some um, some women's circles about um, women's sexuality, they um, in the in the broadest um, um, way possible. Of course, they were not using some of the the, the terms we would use um, nowadays to more easily recognize that this is a conversation about sexuality, but they certainly were talking about women who were banding together. Um, in relationships, whether it be intimate relationships or social relationships, to protect themselves from whether it be racism, um, class oppression, or or oppression by um, men, patriarchy. So the, the the story I tried to tell was one which sort of you know as I reflect on it, it it has really challenged a lot of what we thought we knew we knew about the Rastafari movement. And I should, I should say that uh, one of the things that I tried to do with this, this story is to sort of let people understand that the Rastafari movement that they know today and the, maybe the impressions and stereotypes that they have about it are really due to the, the, the marketing and commercialization that went, um, was involved in the, in, the, in the promotion of reggae music. Um, much of that has very little to do with what the Rastafari movement was and is still intended to accomplish. It was, yes, a religious movement, but it had a very important political agenda. And that political agenda was to, was to liberate the entire African diaspora of colonial rule. Um, they, Jamaica, at the time it started, was a British colony. And, um, as, as, as such, it came with all of the baggage that colonization um, has. I, I heard you mention the term decoloniality before. Well, Rastafari positioned themselves as a, not just an anti-colonial movement, but a movement that was actively pursuing the political <coughs> tools necessary to dismantle the colonial system one of which was to set up alternative forms of government within the country. So they started these communities which were self-sufficient, self-governing, and really tried to model the ideology of sovereignty that they wanted to want to spread. And women were very much interested in this, in, in, in the, in this aspect because it allowed them to acquire some of the material, very real things that, um, for progress. Now, um, that would help them to counteract the, the racism that, that, that was there as well. So one of the things that they, they, they were able to do was to acquire land. And with access to land, they had now the power to, to, be, uh, more, to be independently productive, earn incomes that would then position them, them and their family to, to, to move upward in the society. And these early communities became very prosperous. They also engaged in, um, in conversations, intellectual conversations around international events, the civil rights event in civil rights movement in the United States by the 1950s and 60s was very important to them. The apartheid, um, the struggle against apartheid in South Africa after it began in 1948 was also very important to them. In fact, uh, many of these women it developed a, a very deep interest in, in joining the struggle against apartheid through the repatriation process. And some of them even started to prepare themselves for movement across the Atlantic to, to go to Africa, particularly Ethiopia, from where they would then help with the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. So overall, uh, the story I tell is one where religion becomes critical to counteracting and, and combating col uh, colonialism and racism and, and all the other intersected dis, um, dis 
disparities and oppressions that, that, that women in particular were facing, things having to do with gender in particular. Um, I am, and I felt it was necessary to do that in the context of the, the American Academy because much of what, when I, when I took up books on religion in, in this country, I, I realized that much of the literature was very critical of what religion represented um, in the United States. It spoke a lot about how religion was being used to either oppress people, religion was being used to promote racism, religion being, being used to promote extreme nationalism. And here I was exploring a, a, a group of deeply religious people who had decided that religion was supposed to function as a liberatory force and one that would unify everyone rather than, than split them apart. Uh, I want to end by just let you, letting you know that the Rastafari, even though it, it uh, positioned itself as a, in response to the, the disappointment with Christianity, essentially, what it did was to extend or develop Christianity. Many of these people came out of the churches, they had read their Bibles from cover to cover, and, and the fundamental premise of this religion was that they, you know, when Christ promised that they return, they, it actually happened. So they have extended it beyond what Christ, where Christianity stopped. And I, I leave it there. I look forward to this to the discussion. Yeah. So interesting. Thank you all for this opportunity. And I've got to warn you, I'm talking about a book I'm still writing. So I might go a little long and stop me if I talk too much. It's much easier to be concise when you finish thinking through something. <laughs> um, so thank you for the opportunity. Thank you all for being here on this beautiful day. Breezy, but be beautiful. Um, the racialization of religion is an essential issue. I think not just to America, but to our understanding of what religion is. And I want to talk a little bit today, both about how this concept of the racialization of religion influences our experiences as embodied humans in America and um, issues of what religion might be and how it's studied. I want to say first that because of, as you've just said, um, law, social status, citizenship, access to justice being entangled with religion in America, this is not just a question about um, what is religion. It is a, a daily concern for individuals in this country whose experiences are shaped by assumptions about their religious identity and their racial identity. So I'm gonna do something a little bit different. I knew I would be introduced with my academic pedigree and it's Arab American Heritage Month. So I'm going to intertwine some of my scholarship with a little bit of my personal story. And I'm doing this I hope because the juxtaposition may help those who are watching think through some of the assumptions you hold or the ways that this panel maybe responds to issues at least one person has experienced living in America these last decades. I'll try and keep this short because I'm looking forward to conversation. As you've just heard, I'm a specialist in European Christianity in the pre-modern period. My work, among other things, also seeks to address religious intolerance and religious discrimination through teaching, public outreach, and other things. I'm also an Arab American who grew up in the Middle East during the Lebanese Civil War, the first Gulf War, and then came to the US at 18 to study medieval Europe and North Carolina. I defended my dissertation at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, as you heard, in a building named to honor a high-ranking member of the KKK. This building has subsequently been renamed Carolina Hall. I currently teach history of Christianity here, the Department of Classics, Archaeology, and Religion. Um, and I note that our university was funded and established the sale of 269,692 acres of Great and Little Osage lands and built by enslaved Africans. And thinking through my comments today, I also took a brief moment to look at the biography of the person who's building or after whom the building I work in was named. If you're interested, and I can say more later, but I work in Swallow Hall and George Swallow, among other things, was briefly jailed in 1862 under suspicion of disloyalty to the Union for being a Confederate spy. 
Um, he was later released for taking, after taking a loyalty oath. In other words, every aspect of my academic life, I think and feel is shaped directly by the history of race and racial discrimination in America. But I didn't realize how this informed my assumptions or my scholarship until I'd been at the University of Missouri for several years. Our students pushed me to think about this, but also I was invited to contribute an essay to a, I actually wrote it, to a project thinking about um, race and religion and Christianity. And I was asked if I could write anything about Christianity in Africa in the Middle Ages. And I realized, no, <laughs> I can't. Nobody ever asked me that before. Here I am, I've written a book, I have a PhD, and it's the first time in my life that I'm aware of the fact that nothing in my education to that moment had ever pushed me to consider that question. I've done a lot of work since, both trying to think about how it was possible to earn these degrees without gaining that knowledge and to educate myself about a lot more. So my, one of my projects is thinking through some of that history and to think about and recognize that the medieval Christianity I was trained to study is part of the work of 19th and 20th century European and American scholars who were engaged in what would become religious studies and were working with a bunch of assumptions based on their own colonial mentalities and their Christian identities. They viewed the Europe I was studying as a transformational conduit through which Christianity was cleansed of its Jewish Semitic origins and fully transformed into the most advanced of all religions, modern, Germanic, Protestant, globally dominated, culturally advanced. Um, Sorry, I should watch what I'm doing, huh? Um, I'll leave the work of discussing America and modernity to the other participants on this panel and just talk a little bit more about the history and a little bit more about the whiteness of Christianity in America, which is embedded in this history. Um, drawing on a range of sources, these scholars put forward a number of assertions. One even described... Um, Oh, how does it go? Like Protestantism is the greatest gift that Europe gave to the world. And as Tomo Tomoko Masuzawa noted over a decade ago in a beautiful book, The Invention of World Religions, the modern discourse on religion and religions was from the very beginning, that is to say inherently, if also ironically, a discourse of othering. In other words, to say these religions are different from the secular, the modern, the European, the American, to say that Islam is a religion of brutality, to say that Judaism is a religion that is less advanced, to say some pretty abhorrent things. Until recently, until very recently, the work of religious studies has assumed this sort of evolution of the modern secular nation state as a natural fact, saying we are a secular nation, separation of church and state. And part of that work involves othering less modern, their words, less rational, more religious people as racially different others, as culturally different. This is not just an abstract academic problem. As you may have noticed, if you read the New York Times inside higher ed, the Chronicle of Higher Education, or just in academia or at a school board meeting, um, the study of American and European history has for several years been at the center of controversies both over white supremacy in our fields and white supremacist interest in the historical work we produce. As a medievalist, I feel this very much. One aspect of my work as a historian of, the Christi historian of Christianity challenges the misconception that the European Middle Ages was exclusively or predominantly white and Christian. And the, that white Christian settlers were the only part of the founding story of America or the only part of what it means to be American. I'll skip some of this. So I'm addressing this in two ways right now. First, through the Confluences Project, which some of you have been involved with. We're working, um, a team of us are working to document religious diversity and build religious dialogue here in Missouri. And second, through my own research as a historian of Christianity, one thing I'm trying to do is um, find a way to write the history of Europe without continuing this narrative. And one thing I think is very interesting to that history is the role of paper upon which our books are written, because paper is a technology that came to Europe from the East, developed in China, 
um, brought to Europe through Islamic civilization. And this model reflects the historical reality that there were more Christians in Africa and Asia than in Western Europe before the year 1000, that European empires were far less mighty and consequential than those of the rest of the world prior to the 1490s. And that in the present moment, there are more Christians outside of Europe and North America than inside. In other words, Christianity has not been and still is not a white religion or Euro-American religion. What is at stake to me in all this work is something deeply personal. It's about more than getting the historical facts right. Determining what really happened is important, but I think what matters most is how understanding a bigger picture, seeing a wider and more comprehensive history helps us become aware of how our attention to how individuals fit into these stories shapes their access to freedom in this country. It also matters because I see this as part of an important project of stopping religious and racially motivated violence from escalating. Here, I will be a little bit personal. I have seen how militias and political movements used warped historical narratives, iconography and propaganda drawn from religious history in their fights. For some Lebanese Muslims and Druze, resisting US, French and Israeli armies meant continuing the legacy of Salah Hadin's battles against European crusaders. And some Lebanese Christians insist they are not Arab, but Phoenician or Roman, and that they are fighting to protect themselves from new waves of Muslim invaders. In the US right now, just as in Lebanon in the 1960s and 70s, Dangerous, version of Christ, dangerous versions of Christian history are being used to argue that some refugees and some citizens are dangerous, are invading, that they are harming America, and that violence may be an appropriate response to these perceived attacks on our nation. Right now, white nationalists are working across the country to recruit followers who seek a sense of heritage and want to restore their country to a pure past, a past that historians know didn't really exist, but knowing that doesn't change the power of that narrative. So I want to just wrap up with a couple of final comments and say, first of all, that Christianity is essential to living in America. From the, cal from the calendar we follow to the ways we care for our dead and the billboards you see on our roads, to the oaths we swear on sacred books. In the US, Christianity shapes culture in ways you may not even notice unless you are forced to notice, or unless you are not Christian. And because of this, I think, those are who are not Christian and those who are Christian but are not Euro-American Protestants are more easily racialized, more easily made other, and less fully acknowledged as citizens. Here, I will be a little bit personal and share a few things with you. My Lebanese father tells me that his ancestors marched from Kurdish Iraq to Salah Hedin Ayyubi and settled in Lebanon during the Crusades. My American mother tells me that her mother was born on the Mississippi River in Muscatine, Iowa, and that she grew up in St. Joseph, Missouri for a while where her father, my great grandfather taught school. His black walnut cake is a family legend. Does knowing those stories change in any way how you see me and what you think of the scholarship I'm doing? I'm not sharing this because I want you to tell me whether I'm white enough or American enough to be taken seriously, because I want you to think about how learning those two things might have changed the way that you perceive me as a light skinned Arab, as someone who can pass for white and Christian, but sometimes isn't. I remember in high school in Beirut, applying to universities in the US, asking for help with a box of my college applications. I didn't know what race to mark. <laughs> Many people have had this story. Yes, do. Could I possibly be Asian? Was I white? What did that mean? I didn't know then that Arabs are legally white, that judicial decisions in 1915 and 44 allowed Arabs whiteness for legal purposes when you could only be a U.S. citizen if you were white. But as you've learned since 9-11, regardless of whether or not Arabs, Muslims, and those of Middle Eastern and North African descent are categorized as white on census documents, that whiteness is precarious too often transformed into categories like terrorist, traitor, and worse. I want to turn back to Missouri now and say that when I drove here today, as I drive everywhere in Missouri, the first thing I see when I turn right or left is a 19th century church with a graveyard. 
the church and graveyard are linked to one of the four documented lynchings in Callaway County. And as I traverse this landscape, I often reflect on the tranquility of rural Missouri. I see the cattle and the horses of my neighbor's pastures and wonder why there is no sign marking this history and what people who haven't seen and learned that story think of the church and the graveyard. Now that I know it's hard for me not to link the absence of any marking to the attacks and vandalism against black churches in Missouri, including those that have happened in the last few years in Callaway County and across the nation and the ways in which Christianity, whiteness and violence are linked in America, where Christians who are not white are also too often subject to violence and discrimination. So to close, um, and I think I've talked too long, sorry. I just wanna just summarize and say that the biases of Euro-American scholars still support a historical narrative that contributes to the racialization of religious groups and the discriminations against and disbelief of and sometimes genocidal violence against religious groups who are viewed as not part of a nation. But also the racialization of religion means that we disbelieve people who are of that religion, but not of that race. In other words, Jews of color, white Muslims. And so I guess what I'd really like to know from the panel is to hear their thoughts and to learn from them. But I'd like all of us to just think about where we live and the reality that those who cannot pass for or are not white and Christian are thus perceived as not fully citizens and thus not fully deserving of justice and have to balance being authentically human with keeping themselves safe and free. Sorry, I talked a bit long. <laughs> Thanks for this, the chance. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna open up to some questions. I don't know if we have questions online. We do have quite an audience out there, I think, that we can't see. <laughs> um, can, I, Ann, can I respond? To oh, absolutely. <laughs> and then I'll ask, then I'll ask my question. Have a conversation. So the first thing I, I wanted to talk about uh, was the, the intersection of blackness, especially African-American identity and Muslimness and Muslim identity. Uh, so I intentionally didn't, I didn't want my book to be 400 pages because nobody would. <laughs> so I had to make a decision early on, which was a tough one, but, but I stand by it. And I just want to explain that this book is about Muslims who immigrated, voluntarily immigrated to the US after 1965 and their children and their grandchildren from pri primarily Middle East, North Africa and South Asia. That's just, those were the migration trends. That doesn't mean that black Muslims or African-American Muslims aren't racialized, but I, my reading of the literature is that, or of history, is that African-American Muslims were, have always been black first, whereas those who immigrated post-1965 and, and pre, but there was just so few pre-1965, have been foreign first. And that tends to dominate the, the stereotypes. And then you intersect with multiple identities. So a Black Muslim is a particularly dangerous type of Black person, a particularly subversive type of Black person someone that the state um, needs to jail, just like that's part of the mass incarceration system, but, uh, but for political reasons that they are seen, I mean, if you, to the extent they get incarcerated, they're political prisoners more than anything else. Now, I, these are the stereotypes that they face. Whereas when you are talking about the immigrants, um, the Muslim immigrants, they are foreigners, they are coming to invade from outside, right? They are secret stealth cells, terrorist cells that are weighed Trojan horses. It's a very different narrative. It does, if you think of concentric circles, there is certainly the, the commonality is security threat, right? Domestic security threat. And then you have the international security threat with the immigrants. And what's, so if you, I have some parts in the book that show how pre 9-11, this, the relationship or the, between the stereotype of the dangerous Muslim, right? Or of, of violence, danger, and Islam came pre 9-11 from the black 
civil rights activist, especially Nation of Islam, Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, right? There, there was a whole subset, right, of civil rights leaders who were openly Muslim and who were black separatists and who used Islam as a liberation theology. Uh, and that was a serious threat to the state, as much as the Black Panther Party was, as much as MLK was. I find it very frustrating the way that everybody's now glorifying MLK when he was on the enemy blacklist of J. Edgar Hoover. So that in itself is, I'm sure people have written about that, but talk about revisionist history. And then the question is why, you know, why is the establishment liberal white or liberal white establishment doing that? Um, but nonetheless, and then you had what they called the Mohammedan Turk. And that was originating from Orientalism, bringing, importing the European Orientalism. And then that kind of after 1965, you had now this domestic um, pre growing presence of Muslims from Iran, from Lebanon, from Syria. Although, uh, Rabia, I'm sure you're familiar with the history of, of Syrian Le Levantine immigrants who were primarily Christian, not exclusively, but they started coming in the late 1800s. But based on, there's not a, a lot of accurate estimates of how many they were, but the highest I found was about 500,000. Compare that to the 16 million that were coming from Ireland and Italy and Eastern Europe who were Jewish and Catholic. So they were not seen as a, as a threat because their numbers were so small. And then also many of them Christian and they used their Christian identity to when they went to court and said, I'm white, I'm white. Let me naturalize because there was a law it said, you can't naturalize if you're not a white person as a citizen, and therefore I can vote, and therefore I can own property, and therefore I have certain access to you know, credit and, and other values. And it's actually, they are the ones that we can either thank or blame for the ultimate decision that was finalized in the 1970s by the federal government and then incorporated into the census that if you are from the Middle East or North Africa, you are white. Interestingly, that is very similar to the Jews, Catholics, and Mormons in the early 20th century who were white by law, but they were not experiencing the privileges of whiteness socially. And they, their phenotype did make them different because at that time you have to remember, and you mentioned this about Germanic, Protestant, I, I kind of use Northwestern European Protestant of the way that they, they look different. If you look, than those who were from Southern Europe in terms of height, in terms of hair color, in terms of eye color, in terms of shades of skin. Same thing with Eastern European Jews. It's fascinating. I mean, when I was reading this book, it just reminded me of what I knew in the abstract, which is the social construction of race. But they were seen as darker, as not as white because it was very Scandinavian and Northwest European in terms of the phenotype. And now nobody even asks that. Nobody, every, the, the concept of whiteness has expanded significantly to anything originating in, in Europe. Um, so I just wanted to, to identify that and, and acknowledge that, and this, is, this actually has a contemporary um, impact because on the one hand, African-American Muslims at least based on what I've, you know, the, the facts, the empirical data have not been as severely targeted by national security practices as the immigrant and their, you know, and their ancestors or their heirs or their progeny. However, they have been to some extent. It's, it's, it's a, this is empirical work that really needs to be done. But they are absolutely victims of mass incarceration against black communities, without a doubt. But when you look, of, if you go and look at why is someone of North African or South Asian descent in jail post 9-11, large numbers of them were, were caught in sting operations that are terrorism related. They were targeted by the state. Uh, they, you, you're not seeing as many non-terrorism related crimes, right? And, and vice versa. Meanwhile, you have anti-Black racism excuse me, you have, yeah, you have anti-Black racism within Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities. Yeah. And that is something that the communities are now struggling with. The new communities, I talked about this in the last chapter, 
the new generation is working through that. Um, many of them have done what Jews did and what other minority groups have done over the decades, which is rely on African-American communities to teach them how to fight for civil rights because African-American communities have been doing it for centuries. They are seasoned. You know, if you think of when the NAACP was created, when the Urban League was created, when all of these uh, African-American civil society groups, at least a hundred years. Meanwhile, Muslim communities, we're talking 10, 15, like with the exception of the mosques. We had the, the, the old ones, the established Muslim civil society groups were established in the 1990s. So they, there's, they don't know what, and then most of the time before 9-11, they were doing what most immigrants are told to do when they get here, explicitly or implicitly, which is to stay as far away from black people as possible, right? They're told, do not let your kids be friends with black people. Do not let your kids marry black people. Do not live with black people. Do not go to school with black people because black people are thugs and they're gangsters and they're criminals and they're, and they're dangerous and you need to stay away from them. If you came here for social mobility and to have access to opportunity, and to create a better life for yourself because you left your family, you left everything that you knew. It's very difficult to immigrate. You, you need to stay away from that. And add to that, their colonial homes of, or their col formerly colonized countries of origin who have told them through Orientalism that you are inferior to whites, whiteness, Europe, Christianity, um, and enlightenment, that's all civilized and modern. If you want to be elite in your country and have high status, you need to be as Europeanized as possible and anything, but don't worry, you're still superior to the Sub-Saharan Africans. So it's global anti-Black racism. But these, so what I'm saying is, I mean, when, when I used to say this in the nineties, when I became racialized, it was as if somebody was gonna put me in an insane asylum in the community. Now these conversations are being, they're, they're, they're being had within the young Muslim communities that are, that are of immigrant origin. And I think that's just a really important, uh, it's in development. So anyone who wants to do research, I'm always telling people, graduate students, I have a lot of research projects and that suggestions for you because there's so much work and not enough time to do it. Um, but, but I do take note of, of that. And, and there's some excellent uh, scholars who have worked on African-American Muslim uh, history uh, that, that I cite in the book and I highly recommend. Right. I, you know, as you, were, as you were talking, I just, um, I started to think too about uh, how um, one of the conversations that I found women were having in the 1930s and 1940s in um in 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 the in the, in the rest of our end. and one of the things that um they said or or one of the things they tried to do was to was to not have a conversation about their religious identity um that the religious identity became uh the 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 the, the main means through which they were they were viewed and therefore the main means of their oppression when they, 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 so they were black in a colonial setting where the colonial system operated a tripartite racial system as well, right? White at the top, brown in the middle, black at the bottom. But when I thought going into <coughs> work that the Rastafari identity would just compound everything and make it worse, but actually what, what it did was to, was to, was to sort of they, what they were experiencing was that everything else just didn't matter. It was the Rastafari identity that really changed the game for them because there were assumptions made about, about their religious beliefs, assumptions made about why they would want to become this sort of, um, join this kind of, kind of movement. And so whenever they tried to have a conversation about justice and about what we're doing you know, what was right and so on they may were very careful not to have 
not to talk about their religious beliefs or their religious identity because they realize that their religion in, 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 in a very, 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 very obvious way become even trumped the color of their skin. That religion became their, 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 their identity, the identity that was the most um, critical for the people who were opposing them. And I, I, I wonder if- Wait, I'm sorry. So it was their religious identity was used to dismiss them and discount them and discredit them? Yes. Uh -huh. Right. So, and I wonder how that, if, if, if it is that that is the situation that we can, that might be what, what is playing out here in terms of the, um, in terms of the Muslim, um, Muslim identity, because if it is that 9-11 um, has sort of made Islam into this sort of, given the impression that it's this monstrosity, this, this dangerous religion, then, then is it about the religious identity and the racial, because it's happening in a, in a country with, with a legacy of racism, the racial discourse becomes part of that, but it's still not the critical thing that's, that, that, that's there. Because within the, colonial, um, within the colonial environment in Jamaica, racism was, was, was a fact, it was undeniably a fact. But then when they had to deal with the Rastafari community, they suddenly forgot that they were black and all they could talk about was that they were, they were Rastafari. Right. That's a good point. Except, so that would be a, a comparable analysis if you're talking about white converts to Islam, or black, okay, I see what you're saying, black converts to Islam or black Muslims, yeah. right. But with the immigrant Muslims, it's very different because Pre 9/11, and I'm really interested in hearing, you know, what you've what you've either experienced personally or your research is, you know, the the pre 9/11 experience of of people who again Muslims who immigrated in the last 40 or 50 years was was I think more based on phenotype, and religion didn't play as much of a of a dominant role or religious identity except for in certain points in history because of the media concentration. So in 1979, during the Islamic revolution, yes, if you were Iranian, it wasn't just that you were Iranian, you were an Iranian Muslim radical, all of you, no matter who you were. And most of the Iranians who were here at the time were graduate students and they were interrogated on, at a systematic level, they were deported, many of them. They had to register, special registration, which by the way, those, you know, the law students and lawyers in the room, the Immigration Nationality Act makes it completely legal to require non-immigrants to specially register. That is not a post 9-11 development. It's just the enforcement of it. Of and similarly, the 1990, Gulf War, many Iraqis who were in the US were interrogated, some of them were deported. Um, so you you dealt, it was similar to what the Japanese experienced. And, and some to some extent, the Italians and even less extent, the Germans during World War One and World War Two. But then when the when the conflict ended, when the crisis ended, things would kind of settle down and individual Muslims could kind of try to go back to normal. And it was very much based on what you look like. So if you're from Southern Egypt, for the most part, you are more likely to be raced as a light-skinned African-American or as a biracial person, but in the US because of the one drop rule, which was very much a product of slavery, right? Then you were black. And so that person then was, was not going to pass as white or being Muslim wasn't going to be this interesting, odd, exotic, why are you wearing the hijab? Are you a nun? Which was a very common you know, question. It's like, are you a nun? But asking but that question was not a threatening one. It was like, oh, that's so interesting, but you're married. How does that work? <laughs> and then it was more about being exotified right? Right. or being saved. There was the misogynistic 
stereotype that, that Muslim women were oppressed by their male relatives. But after 9-11, that's the transformation. It was, and we kept waiting, okay, this is three years, this is five years, this is seven years, this is eight years, it's permanent. And Trump just kind of put the stake down and said, if there was any doubt that Islamophobia is not here to stay, let me show you, I can, get a re I can get elected on that platform. And he did. He got elected based on anti-immigration, which was focused on Central Americans, Latinos and Muslims, and Islamophobia. So I guess I should quickly respond because I see we have questions from the audience. Um, I want to just, first of all, acknowledge, I think that's a really important part of the history and the narrative um, that, there was definitely, and like, there are accounts of and documented cases of lynchings of both Arab Americans and Jewish Americans in the Italians. Early, yeah, and Italians in the early 20th century. And so you're right that 9 11 has absolutely made things worse. I think, however, um, and those of us were here and watched that transformation of how people were perceived happen. Mm. Um, I mean, can say more about just what it means to be perceived suddenly no longer as fully American or perhaps as a danger to the nation, right? But um, there's also, you know, you asked about sort of scholarship on this. There's also some really interesting work that's been done thinking through the ways in which Islam is directly linked to violence as a religion of violence. Mm -hmm. And that that is part of a narrative that hinges on a sort of this, I'll be a brief professor, right? Hinges on the assumption that the most idealized advanced form of human civilization is a secular democracy mm -hmm. and that nations and cultures that are more religious are less advanced. In other words, it is a racial hierarchy in a sense, or at least a nationalistic hierarchy. And so um, been thinking through sort of the idea of religious violence being linked to Islam, that Muslims are inherently violent because of 9-11. And how what had been perhaps the trope of the Arab terrorist because of um, the Arab-Israeli wars became the terror of the Muslim as opposed to, and so I guess what I would just sort of rambling ask us to think about is what is at stake when we racialize a religion, part of what's at stake is that we lose the diversity within that religion and lose a recognition of um, all the different people within that religion who may not be of a particular, or like that they are not monoliths, right? And that they do not necessarily all belong to the same race. And so thinking about the nation of Islam in particular, one thing that has always come to my mind was the conversation I had many years ago in which a Muslim friend said they're not Muslim, mm -hmm. in part, presumably, because they're American and Black, right? I mean, just this idea that there's also within a religion, sometimes really complicated dynamics, both about race and about who fully belongs to a religion and who doesn't, right. that are part of it, but not all of it. So I just want to respond to the, um, to the issue between the theological debates, because this is when it gets really difficult to unpack. And I, I don't wanna, this is gonna sound apologistic, but I wanna, yeah. I wanna complicate it. Um, when the Nation of Islam you know, established itself, theologically, there were some serious differences between definitely Sunni Islam, and I would say even by extension, Shia Islam. And, the, and it, was, it was a deal breaker for Sunni, for Sunnis in particular, but I think even for Shias, which is that they believed Fard, Muhammad Fard was God, was Allah, and he's a human, which is heretic in, in Orthodox Islam, whether you're Shia or Sunni. The second is they, they believe that Elijah Muhammad was his prophet. That's also heretic because we believe that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last prophet. Um, and that and then there were some difference in how Islam was practiced ritualistically. There were some. My understanding is that Nation of Islam didn't believe you had to pray five times a day, you could pray three. There were differences in how fast fasted. So that was more the kind of the ritualistic. But 
um, I'm, I think it was Sylvia Dion, Sylviane Dion who wrote about this, but there's, there's authors who've written about these clashes that happened between Malcolm X before he converted to Sunnism and he did convert to Sunnism uh, and graduate students in New York City who were from the Sudan, there was one in particular, and, and other in Egypt, um, and how they would hear him, and he was a very dynamic speaker, but then he, they would confront him and say, this is not Islam. What you're doing is not Islam. You're, you're distorting the religion. You need to understand that there is no other prophet. Or blah, blah, blah. And he would have these debates, and of course, he was pushing back on that. But that also was one of the reasons why, you know, to the extent there were immigrant Muslims at this time, we're talking about the 1960s. So you started the national origin laws, quotas were lifted 65. That's one of the reasons why they didn't join the nation of Islam. I mean, among other reasons is to them, like that's not the Islam we were taught. But of course that doesn't take away that there isn't anti-black racism, it absolutely is. But that conversation, it's somewhat sensitive because when, especially in the contemporary era, you want to be able to say, I don't want to discount and discredit what your religion is. But at the same time, you want to acknowledge that that is not what I consider the religion to be. And how do you do it without falling into the trap of subordinated communities fighting each other and then being distracted from the systems that oppress them? Uh, so it's somewhat of a mute, moot issue, as you may know, because in 1970s, uh, W.D. Muhammad, Ward Dean Muhammad, which was the son, one of the sons of Elijah Muhammad, converted to Sunniism. And he took, I think it's around 85% to 90% of the followers of the nation Islam with him. And so now Louis Farrakhan, who is the official leader, the, his, his congregation is, is minuscule compared to um, Orthi Muhammad. So it's somewhat of a mooted issue, but, but many of those who are now self-identify as Sunni or Orthodox Muslims who are African-American, their parents or their grandparents were in the nation of Islam. And so for them, that is definitely part of their religious identity. So uh, I, I, this thing about the US being a secular country I just, it's not. It's not. Right? Right? So <laughs> I know. can say that it is, right? right? But it's not. And I think that. Yeah, Europeans you, always remind us of that. You mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned Derek Bell, right? And so he, the permanence of racism. And so I think that it's a really um, conniving, but it's a, it's an easy sell, right? To racialize a religion because Christianity is definitely racialized as white and then there's the black church right and you're familiar with the religious studies sort of lingo around that and that was one of my frustrations with religious studies was that i had two religious studies degrees before i like crossed the street to sociology to talk about race you know and, and learned about identity and we are way behind in that as you know <laughs> from your uh from your uh research and so how do we I guess I'm wondering how we situate, and I'm thinking of like making my undergraduate students understand that this is not a secular country. Even though it's written down somewhere and there's Christianity all around that, <laughs> the so writing of- 2022. You know what and I mean? That is proof that this is not a secular country. Yeah. It's 2022. There are other calendars. Mm. We are not on the Muslim calendar today. I mean, some of us could be if we wanted to be, but we're not, it's 2022. That is where I always start. Sorry to cut you off, <laughs> keep talking. <laughs> but in, I appreciated the way that you said the, the fetishization of the law. And I think that it might extend to white people who are like, oh no, but you have civil rights, right? And then there's the question of whether you can actually exercise those, which is, is never the question asked, right? Like, and realized by white people is that, of course you have civil rights what are you complaining about you know and it's like well i went to vote and then my rights were denied by certain people around me and so i, I guess you know the the conversation around schools and indoctrination and all that yes 
we've already been indoctrinated to think that this is a secular country and that you know everyone's equal and so i think i, I well what one time behind that? yeah one concept which i i know the religious studies experts are have been were exposed to in their studies is civil religion right robert mm -hmm. bella's civil religion that's helpful in at least understanding how religion went from being from the front stage to the backstage, but it's still there. Mm -hmm. It may not be as explicit. Religion doesn't have to be you go to church every day or every Sunday, right. but it doesn't have to be that you wear a cross on, you know, in, on your neck every all the time. It can be, it's, it's now integrated into the very society from the calendar to the holidays to, I mean, do you know how frustrating it is when on your religious holiday there's an exam or there's a a meeting at work and you want to go and enjoy it because it's your christmas mm -hmm. it's your easter right or when you're there is a religious practice that is required of you and whether it's the food that you eat whether the pray, prayer time or whether you're fasting and the entire society is setting things up to make it so difficult for you to practice that. Um, well, and I think that that's always been, that's the origin, right, of the United States, that, that that religious freedom, as you say, is this thing that we supposedly love to have and we've had since the beginning, but it's really only religious freedom for different types of Christianity. Right, and, that, but know. that's my point. The fact that Christianity is accommodated mm -hmm. in the entire system, that is also evidence of religion being part of our life and laws. I'm curious to the law experts in the room, how much of that is because that I speculate and sometimes even claim that it's because American law is influenced by British law, which was embedded with church law. Mm -hmm. And so often, and also a lot of our judges and a lot of our legislators over the years have been Christian. And so it's like, that layer means that the ways that people who've written our laws think about law is influenced by Christianity? Like, is there a legal study that looks at that at all? I mean, there are, I, I, the way that we're taught it is that the first amendment was actually, especially the establishment clause <coughs> was included to prevent the state, right, from, establishing a state religion that would be superimposed on society. And I think it's become acceptable now that many of the quote founding fathers were deists. Mm -hmm. And some of them may have even been atheists and didn't mm -hmm. want to admit it. But they were not the zealot Protestants or Puritans. However, during that period, the society was a zealously Protestant. And the people who self-selected it to come to this new country that was, I mean, there were Native Americans and there were no Europeans. And so they, they left their home, they left their country, they left their everything. Uh, it, they self-selected themselves because of their feeling of being religiously persecuted by the Anglican church mm -hmm. and wanting to come here and be as zealous as possible. <laughs> Right? And there, so when you're a deist or maybe a, or an agnostic or maybe a closet or secret atheist, <clears throat> but you've got this society. And I think that's what, that was the balance that they made was we'll do the free exercise because we know that we would all, we could be killed <laughs> by the zealots if, if we don't allow them mm -hmm. to do what it is they came here to do, even though we find that I mean, it was a very kind of elitist perspective on religion of you know this is for the masses this is for the people because they were the elites but at the same time we don't want the state to establish religion and i don't think actually the people wanted that either because they saw the anglican church as part of that problem of the establishment um so 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 to answer your question i i think that most legal scholars at least the way we're taught is that no, we're very different from Europe. No, no, Europe had the general warrants and we have the Fourth Amendment. Uh, Europe had, you know, there are all of these laws that, it's not Europe, England, excuse, England had all these laws that 
violated what we call civil liberties. And we learned from that. And that's why we have all of these, these rights. Even, even the Second Amendment is about the right to bear arms, to be able to overthrow your government because of the way that they felt that the British were oppressing them. So now that's a, but I, I'm sure that there's legal historians who have probably provided a much more nuanced um, understanding, but I'm just telling you in, in law schools, that's kind of what, that's the narrative we're fed. Okay, so I'm looking at our time yeah. and our time is running out. We have questions on oh, okay. Zoom and perhaps in the room as well from our folks. Um, anyone in here? We'll go to our Zoom questions. You seem ready to read. Yeah. All right, all right. Um, and this will be rapid fire. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll go in order in that they came in. Um, so it seems that questions of race were at the earliest stage of Christianity. One major early question was in relation to circumcision for Gentiles. How did this question of cultural responsibilities to other races form into harder racist ideology? I can answer that. Do it. Yeah, I don't so think I can answer early Christianity. Is that is that what they said in the yeah, beginning? In the early so days. right, like the conception of what we think about as race now is a modern conception. So people would have been the, the Romans went out and conquered some group of people, it would have been what language they speak. And um, let's absorb them into, you know, our community or, you know, throw them to the lions, basically. Um, and so I'm not sure that that's actually a question that's answerable until really uh, in the United States, this is sort of solidification of white Christianity versus race. And of course, white Christians are not racing themselves, right? Racializ racializing themselves. Next question. <laughs> And thank you for sharing. Sure. That's how, we should start. Uh, <laughs> how can we build better coalitions between different religions, bearing in mind those various intersecting identities discussed? I'll I, I'll answer it, and then if others want to, I want to because this is this is actually a lot more complicated than it seems. So the kumbaya response is: let's do more interfaith. <laughs> more, more. more interfaith. Mm. And in fact, that was the response of most of the Muslims who were adults in say the first 10 years after 9-11. Because remember right now, the, the new leaders are 25 to 30 to, in, to 35. So they were born right before 9-11 mm -hmm. and now they're, they're just graduated from college. Okay, so they only know 9-11, post 9-11. But the ones who were already adults and knew 9-11, I said, here's the problem. They just don't know us, they just don't know us. We got to open up our mosques for iftar. We got to open up our mosques for mo mosque visit day. We got to have people over for dinner. We got to do all of these interfaith. Don't forget the acoustic guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and and all and there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is it's band aid. That's all dealing with symptoms and not the causes. Because and and, and the other problem it practically is. You're talking about no more than 6 million people in this country. The estimate, the low estimate is four, the high estimate is six. That's not, that's 1.5 to 2% of the entire population. Imagine all that attention on just a tiny little minority that are supposedly invading the country and are a Trojan horse. But the problem is when you do the interfaith, how are those conversations structured? Whose perspectives are centered? It's the Muslims trying to prove their innocence. It's the Muslims trying to prove that their religion doesn't conflict with modernity and the enlightenment and liberalism and American notions of democracy and separation of church and state and, and, and white Christianity, especially Protestantism. It's not centering the perspectives of Muslims or the perspectives of everybody where, what are the ground rules for this conversation? How are we framing it? Why, why is separation of church and state even an issue? That's your issue, but that's actually a minority global view. Most religions and most religious people who self-identify as religious, whatever their religion is across the world, life is their religion, right? The, you don't say, oh, okay, I'm just gonna put it in the pot, put it in the corner here, so put it in my house. 
but their lived experience is their religion is all about that. And then you have a different conversation about the state, but but I think that's the that's the challenge is how do you engage? So I'm not anti interfaith, but I am um, anti co anti. They're not coalitions then. They're they're just reproducing the superordination and subordination under the guise of a coalition. But who gets to set the agenda? Who gets to frame the questions? Who gets to say, no, no, take everything off the table. I want you to see where I would start. Okay, well, where would you start? And that, that'll rattle people who are not used to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I wanted to kind of draw from the experience because they, um, Rasfari went through this phase after the independence of um, Jamaica and some other Caribbean countries in the 1960s. There was this problem of how do we get this um, to, this religious movement to be um, accepted within the, the, the society? How do we build bridges between this movement and the churches and so on? And there are two things that, that they did that um, really made a difference. One was to the academic community, the academy became very active in trying to document what the movement was about and to try to facilitate um, widespread understanding of this. So that was one thing. And the other and even more critical was the political will to ensure that there was um, greater understanding and less animosity. If there is no political will, and will meaning from the very top, so the government in the 1970s was very much interested in how what this religion had to offer to the society in terms of how it could push it forward. And the, the emphasis of, on the African um, identity of the majority of the population was very strong in that movement. So it became something that the, the political establishment used to enable the movement to sort of become very, very mainstream in the society. And today, if, you know, people, I, I gave a talk earlier today and one of the questions was from the students was, I thought that all um, um, Jamaican people were, were, were Rastafarians. And um, I didn't take offense. I actually, I, I actually was pleased by that because it kind of shows the success of this sort of building of understanding over the years. So much so that even people who might not identify themselves as Rastafarians um, um, use parts of its, its identity when they are overseas because it makes them feel more like more Jamaica. And maybe that's, and maybe that's you know, some, a strategy that can be employed in this situation for people who are interested in building these type of, of bridges. Yeah. I'll really quickly say, I think two things that haven't been mentioned already would be um, more K through 12 education about religions of the world i hate that phrase but like so the <clears throat> students early on learn enough to know that what they get on the top 10 google hits for what is islam is not accurate right some basic religious literacy to be able to sort through stereotypes lies miscommunication rumor propaganda right and i'd say the other thing is to listen to people we disagree with because simply saying you're wrong is going to get us nowhere, but having real conversations with people who you may never be able to reconcile with your perspective is a really important part of building community and working past where we are to get to some place where perhaps people are a little bit more able to be who they want to be. Great. Um, so thank you very much. Are we out of time? Actually, that was a, yeah, we're out of time. Oh dear. That was actually a great question to, to wrap up on. Um, but I do want to quickly read the two last questions because they're they're interesting. I think we've we've handled them in some in, in some ways already. Um, one question is Islamophobia seems to allow the very people who fight for religious freedom to justify violating the rights of Muslims because they view Islam as a political ideology rather than a religion. I'd like to hear from the panel on this as well as differences between Black Muslim communities and other Muslim communities because of this. And of course, um, Zahar, you've already dealt with that, with that part of the question. And tied to this, of course, is the fact that 
um, there are there are black Muslims that immigrate as well. So oh yes, of so, course. So that's another category. Of course. Um, speaking of right intersections. That, of course. Um, that exists. And then the last question, because the racialization of black slaves was a way of extracting free labor and keeping them down economically as a class of people, how would members of the panel connect the Muslim religion to the need for keeping a strong class, class hierarchy in America? Race and class are separate but connected issues, but how is religion, Muslims in parentheses, also used to create class divisions. And of course, we know that slavery before this really yeah. was also based on, on race and, um, and racism, right? Um, mm -hmm. And all the ways in which sub-Saharan Africans were treated by um, the, the um, upper Africa, you know, North, North Africa and the Middle East during that that's part of slavery. So mm -hmm. there are lots and lots of questions. Um, uh, wish we could carry on. Um, this, I think, is something, you know, I was thinking as David and I were, um, were thinking about this panel, um, we, we didn't even, ourselves, we didn't, and of course I'm Christian and David has got a Jewish wife and his family is Jewish and- um, yeah, he's not. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I was at the bar mitzvah. <laughs> but um, we, we didn't even, as, as we planned it, we didn't, I wasn't thinking about Ramadan. And the fact that you are fasting right now, right? No. And, and we I'm and traveling, so I'm not, but yes. <laughs> yes. During, right. during right. this month I am, yes. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, so so um so this this um this understanding or, or non-understanding of of the different religions and the and the hierarchies and so on um is something that we're all really working on and have to as as Dave said, um work on better in terms of creating knowledge and teaching and, and, and understand. So we're really grateful to our Department of Religious Studies for the work that they do. Um, and of course, this work is done in, in places like history and Black studies and, and of our other places. We want to remind you all that we have copies of the Racial Muslim. Um, the, our, our audience can, can get their own free copies um, signed by by Dr. Aziz, <laughs> we want to, um, and then if you're with us on Zoom, please, um, we'll find a way to get the book to you. Um, you deserve a book as well. Um, so Kelly Buckeye, who is managing Zoom, will figure that out. Um, we have a, uh, we, we want to remind you that the Middleton Center is, is, is a center that, um, that is supported by donations from um, the community, both within the, the campus and, and outside. So we're really grateful for all the support thus far. I want to thank, of course, Jen Horton, who helps with our, she's head of our communications for the College of Arts and Science, um, as well as the uh, our other um, uh, sub support staff in the College of Arts and Science and within the, the School of Law. Um, the Middleton Center is, is shared by, by both of those of those units. Um, big thanks to Kelly Buckheit as always for helping us to, to manage this whole, um, this, this, this event. David has already mentioned that Kay Kelly is, is, is on our team and has done a, a, a really great job of, of helping us plan and um, think about the kinds of research that we can do within the, the, the center.